Thank you to Danny and Eric, choir, orchestra, our men's ensemble. We are, wow, what a, what a powerful prayer through song that we just got to experience in worship. Uh, you know, I thought I'd take a moment before we open up our, our Bible to the book of Nehemiah and just address a rumor that's been going around about my facial hair that I know you've been curious about. Why is he not trimming that beard and why can't he get a haircut? Is it A, he can't afford it? Four kids, you can't afford it. Is it B, there's no time? C, he's going to play Jesus in the Easter pageant. Or D, all the above. <laughs> well, we're going to go with C today. And uh, when, when Pastor Stan was talking to me about this, he said, you know, Jesus has a singing part this year. And the choir and orchestra just started laughing at me. And I was offended. And I said, well, nobody's going to come to the Easter pageant. So I'm not singing, but that is why there is uh, no haircut and no beard trimming in the Witten home right now. Just we'll just put the rumors to rest uh, this morning. This morning, we're going to be in the book of Nehemiah. We're going to walk through the story of Nehemiah. We'll start in chapter one. As you're turning there, I was recently looking at some of history's greatest construction projects. The first one I, I came across was the pyramids at Giza made from two point three million million limestone bricks sourced and lifted by human hands over 500 miles. Its construction claimed countless human lives constructed over a 20 year period. Ordinary people who did something extraordinary. Then I saw the Taj Mahal uh, constructed with a workforce of 20,000 laborers, a time period of 22 22 years accomplished using a thousand load bearing elephants and a team of 30 oxen to transport marble and other materials over this 9.3 mile uh, ramp. They had constructed ordinary people who did something extraordinary. And then the Panama Canal started in 1904, completed 10 years later in 1914, one of history's greatest feats in construction and engineering. It's a single 48-mile ship canal that connects the Pacific Ocean to the Atlantic Ocean. Each door of the locks weighs 750, 750 tons. Ordinary people doing something extraordinary. Now, you may not have known this about me, but I do have some experience in construction. This is the kind of project I oversaw. We missed it by that much. That's how my, that's a John Witten construction project right there. Five years, billions of dollars, and we just barely missed it. You know, each of the first three projects took many years, significant money, you know, human sacrifice, technology for the time, sacrifice. These construction projects make you wonder how in the world... Did these ordinary people do something so extraordinary? Book of Nehemiah, the Israelites are coming back from exile. And there were three major building projects. There was the rebuilding of the temple. There was the rebuilding of the city walls. And then there were the rebuilding of God's people. And so this morning, as we look at Nehemiah, I want you to see how an ordinary person does something extraordinary. Who was Nehemiah? Well, Nehemiah was working as a cup bearer to King Artaxerxes, which means he tasted the wine and the food for the king. I imagine he that was a pretty cool job at some level. You got to eat the best of the best. But if someone tried to poison the king, I'm sorry, Nehemiah, you are the first to go. But that made that meant that Nehemiah had a close and trusting relationship with the king. So living in a place called Susa, and he asks a fellow Jew about the status of Jerusalem. And here's what he finds out in Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 3. They said to me, those who survived the exile and are back in the province are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates have been burned with fire. So Nehemiah is asking here about the state of the city. The report disturbed him. The Jews were in danger. Their city lay in ruins. They had no protection, no security. And so Nehemiah has a burden. He prays about it. God lays on his heart to return, to rebuild the wall. And 52 days later, the wall is complete. Ordinary people, an ordinary person, a cupbearer who does something extraordinary. How does someone ordinary like Nehemiah do that? How do they rebuild the walls in 52 days? How 
how do we follow in Nehemiah's footsteps in our day? How, how can we be ordinary people who make an extraordinary difference? I want to look at some lessons we can learn from the life and ministry of Nehemiah. The first is sit down to cry. What did he do? He, he sat down, he cried. Ordinary people who do extraordinary things sit down to cry. What do I mean by that? Well, look at verse 4. When I heard these things, I sat down and wept. I sat down and wept. When Nehemiah heard that Jerusalem was without protection from their neighbors, his heart broke. When, as he remembered what the city once was, it saddened him. This home of the Jewish people was now run down. It was now at risk. Nehemiah was sensitive to the needs of his people. He was sensitive to the will of God. And so he did something. He was able to do something extraordinary because he was sensitive. And for us to do something extraordinary, we too have to be sensitive. So I'm going to ask you this question, and it may not be a question, maybe some of the men, we don't really think in these terms, but I really want to challenge you that what breaks your heart? What breaks your heart? Is it a family member, a friend, a neighbor that doesn't know Jesus? A social injustice you see that's hurting people badly. Is it hungry people? Is it helping single parent families? Is it taking care of orphans? Is it ministry to prisoners? Is it befriending the lonely? You see, as the people of God, we have to be sensitive to the needs of other people. God has been sensitive to our need. And so our response is to demonstrate that love to other people. And not everything, not every need is going to touch your heart, but something ought to touch your heart. And so for an ordinary person to do something extraordinary, we've got to sit down to cry, meaning something ought to break our heart. We've got to be sensitive to the needs of other people. But but it continues. You see there, the rest of verse 4, what do ordinary people do? They kneel down to pray. They kneel down to pray. For, For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. But when Nehemiah heard about the need, he leaned into the heart of God. He poured himself out, meaning he he fasted. He he emptied himself of his own will and what he wanted to see happen. He gave up food because Nehemiah knew that this great need didn't just need his good idea. He needed a word from the Lord. And so he fasted. He prayed. And as he fasted and as he prayed, he discovered here's an assignment, Nehemiah, with your name on it. This has your name on it. Nobody else's name on it. It's got your name on it. You see, it's when we, we pray and we spend time with the Lord and we hear the, the Lord's desires for our lives and for our situation that we start to understand more of what God wants us to do. So what's broken that God might be calling you to fix? That as you spend time in prayer, you start to see that my time, energy, talent, passion, it's needed in this area. Maybe that's something in your family right now. Maybe it's something in our church. Maybe it's something in our community. Maybe it's something in our world. It's Frederick Buechner who said, The place God calls you is the place where your deep gladness and the world's deep hunger meet. Jerusalem had a hunger. Nehemiah had a hunger. Through prayer, it was laid on to to Nehemiah that he had a clear assignment. And so you you can pray, you can kneel down to pray, something breaks your heart, but you've got to stand up to act. Okay. In chapter two, Nehemiah goes to the king and he says, if it pleases the king and if your servant has found favor in his sight, let him send me to the city in Judah where my fathers are buried so that I can rebuild it. You know, Nehemiah doesn't just sit and sulk over what's been happening. He prays, but he doesn't stop there. Prayer and care are a part of doing something extraordinary. But at some point, the rubber has to meet the road. We've got to get off the bench and get into the game. And so Nehemiah approaches the king with his dream. Hey, I'm going to rebuild the city. You see, Nehemiah knew after spending time with the Lord, it was time to act. And the the first step was to go and visit with the king. And what we also see, ordinary people who do extraordinary things, they they stand up to act and they define their mission clearly. So he goes to the king. He's nervous. The king can say, you're dead. The king can say yes. The king could say no. The king has all the power. Well, the king says, what is it you want? Wow, that's 
That's nice for the king to say, what is it you want? And it says, then I prayed to the God of heaven and I answered the king. If it pleases the king and if your servant has found favor in his sight, let him send me to the city in Judah where my fathers are buried so that I can rebuild the wall. Rebuilding the wall. That was that was the mission that was defined for him. He understood this is what I need to be about. You know, there are so many needs in our world, legitimate needs in our world. But the truth is, as individuals, even as a church, we have have a limited amount of emotional, physical and financial energy. We, we can't do everything. Our, our church can't take on everything. Nehemiah understood that. He, he clearly identified his mission. He's going to go to Jerusalem. He's going to rebuild the wall. What can easily happen is mission creep. And, and, and this can happen in all kinds of ways in our life. I don't know about you, but let's just say I, I, I know I need it. Tomorrow, Monday at the Witten Home is trash day. And I'm in the car. I've got the kids loaded up. And I, need to, I discover, you know what? I need to take out the trash to the dumpster. That's the mission. Well, then I start to get overwhelmed because I see all the stuff that needs to go to the recycle center. And so I load that stuff up. And then then I see that, you know, the garage really just needs to be organized. And so now we're going to go to the recycle center and now we're going to go to Lowe's and get our organizational materials all while the kids are in the car just screaming. That's mission creep. Okay, when you set out to do one thing and you start to do 50, you can't do that. You can't do everything. And so if you want to be an ordinary person who makes an extraordinary difference, you've got to define that mission. You've got to define that mission. Here's what God is leading me to do. Here's what God's calling me to do. So Nehemiah works at making his plan. He, he rallies a team together. He inspires that team then to go after their goal. Hey, we're going to rebuild these walls. You, you see, to, to do something extraordinary, you don't have to be the best. You don't have to be the youngest. You don't have to be the oldest. You just have to care. And you have to care enough to be willing to do something about it. Nehemiah is a cupbearer after all. And now he's leading God's major construction project. But, you know, the interesting thing about Nehemiah, and this is true for our lives. This next point is where a lot of us get hung up. Because like most major accomplishments, you've got to face opposition. You're, you're going to face opposition. But Nehemiah defeated discouragement. And ordinary people who do extraordinary things understand this. That you have to be able to defeat discouragement. He faced discouragement from the outside. There was a, a guy named Sand Ballot. I tried to get my wife. She was looking for an S.A. name for our fourth child. All three, the first three start for, with S.A. And I said, how about Sand Ballot? And she said no. I didn't understand why. I really wanted George Springer, Springer after the Astros. And she said no to that, too. I can't understand why. But when Sand Ballot heard the news, he became angry. And was greatly incensed. He ridiculed the Jews. And in the presence of his associates in the army of Samaria, he said, what are those feeble Jews doing? Will they restore their wall? Will they offer sacrifices? Will they finish in a day? Can they bring the stones back to life from those heaps of rubble burned as they are? Do you hear the negativity? Tobiah the Ammonite, who was at his side, said what they are building, if even a fox climbed up on it, he would break down their wall of stones. You hear the criticism? You see, we often don't face opposition because we're doing something wrong. We often face it because we're doing something right. You know, we have an enemy. And sometimes that enemy will try to discourage us from the outside. Sanbao and Tobiah were, were those two. They were working for the enemy. They were just pointing out all the reasons why it won't work. They were belittling them. They were talking about these, making fun of these big piles of rubble, making fun of the project. A fox could climb on it and knock it down. It's a John Wynn construction project. Nehemiah is facing an enormous amount of criticism. You know, criticism is a part of life. Now, as a side note, that doesn't give us a license to go be critical. Don't be that person. Don't be Sam Ballad. Don't be Tobiah. Because here's what's easy. Easy is critiquing from the sidelines. Here's what's hard. Working inside something for its change. Ordinary people who do extraordinary things work for change. Everybody can critique but not everybody can create. Ordinary people have the imagination to, to create and put it out there for critique. And the truth is, after the thing is done, everybody's wise. 
We can all see how it should have been done. And so if, if our work has never been criticized, it's unlikely we've done any work worthwhile. In order to do something that matters, something extraordinary, it means you're going to be criticized. You're going to face opposition. And if our goal is to be universally liked and respected and understood, then it's probably our goal to do nothing that matters. That wasn't Nehemiah's goal. But, you know, he didn't just face it from the outside. He also faced it from the inside. Our enemy will also do this. This is one of his tactics, discouraging us from the inside. It says, meanwhile, in in chapter 4, the Bible says the people in Judah said this. This is his people. They should be excited about this project. This is for them. The strength of the laborers is giving out. And there is so much rubble that we cannot rebuild the wall. You feel for the guy, don't you? Everywhere he's turning. Criticism, naysayers, internally, externally. You know, some days we may feel like Nehemiah. We may feel the same way. Maybe we feel criticized by a spouse. I hope not. But maybe we do. A co-worker, a child, a parent, an acquaintance. You're discouraged by what you see on the news Discouraged by what you see on social media, on Facebook, and and you have something that God's laid on your heart, a dream, a desire, something you're willing to do, and you just look at it all and go, it just cannot be done. It's not possible. Recently, I came across this this picture and some staff development stuff I was doing with with our team, and and, and it's a question of who's saying you can't. Who's saying you can't? Because some of the voices inside of our head are internal. They're inhibiting us. It's nobody else has told us we can't do it. It's just... Our own internal voice is saying, you can't do it. And then some of the voices that we're listening to are the external voices, the ones outside of us, prohibiting us, saying, this can't be done. It can't be done. And and so the question for us as followers of Christ is, in our world today, who are we going to listen to? Are we going to listen to that internal voice that's telling us no? Are we going to listen to that external voice that's telling us no? Or are we going to stop and say, I'm going to listen to what God has to say about the situation? What voice are we listening to? It's a really important question. And Nehemiah, I think he was having an answer. Who's saying we can't do it? Well, I've got people outside saying we can't do it. I've got folks inside saying we can't do it. So here's what he did. He, He stood up and he said, don't be afraid of them. He said, remember the Lord who is great and awesome and fight for your brothers, your sons and your daughters, your wives and your home. How do you defeat discouragement? How do we defeat discouragement? You remember the Lord. Don't be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who's great and who's awesome. And then number two, you've got to fight for your cause. Remember why we started to do this in the, in the first place. And if God's going to call us to it, he's going to see us through it. He's going to you know, fight for your families and your sons and your wives and your daughters. And so Nehemiah gives us a template. How do we fight back against discouragement? Remember the Lord. Fight for your cause. If you're going to do... Extraordinary things as an ordinary person at church. We're going to do extraordinary things as an ordinary church. Then we're going to have to be able to defeat that discouragement. And just because there's criticism, just because there's discouragement doesn't mean it doesn't need to be done. You know, here's here's something I think is true that that arrogant people deny criticism. Insecure people are crushed by criticism. But mature people are refined through criticism. You see, for Nehemiah, I think that criticism made him all the more focused on his mission. It made him double down on, in his relationship with the Lord. And remember why he started in the first place. Sure, there were people criticizing. Sure, there were people discrediting. Sure, there were people spreading rumors. Sure, there were people trying to get him to compromise, but he wouldn't do it. In fact, he says in chapter 6, uh, they were, he said they were scheming to harm me. So he sent messengers out. Here's how he responded. He said, I'm carrying on a great project and I cannot go down. Why should the work stop while I leave and go down to you? You know, there's people in the cheap seats of our lives. Sometimes we give an expensive seat, expensive voice into ours. And, and we shouldn't do that. And Nehemiah said, I'm not coming down. 
I'm not going to give in. Well, you see, when God's laid something on our heart, when God's laid something on the heart of our, our church, there's going to be discouragement. But that's not an opportunity or an invitation to, to give up or to give in or like Nehemiah to go down. It's an invitation to pray up, to roll up and to dig into the heart of God and see how he works through that situation. And so to be ordinary people who do extraordinary things, we've got to defeat discouragement. But then you start thinking, that's a big task. Rebuilding the walls in 52 days, what's the strategy for that? I mean, there's no crane. There, there's no heavy machinery. How are we going to do that? Well, it says in chapter 3, it gives us a clue how they accomplish this feat. It says, above the horse gate, the priests made repairs. Where? Each in front of his own house. You see, rebuilding the walls, that's difficult work. But there was a section of the wall there. And the homes had a section of the wall in front of that. And and you can't do the whole project, but you can do that section of wall right in front of you. And if you repair what's in front of your home, and your neighbor repairs what's in front of their home, and, and their neighbor in front of their home, you look around, the wall gets completed. And so you may look at, around at your life, at your family. You may look at our world. All there is to do in the church. And, and you start listening to that internal and external discouragement. Can't be done. Too overwhelming. We don't have what we need. But Nehemiah did his part. And he encouraged everybody else to do theirs. And when everybody did their part, repaired the wall in front of their own home, something extraordinary happened. I've had the opportunity to go on many different mission trips over the years. And and one of my favorite moments out of all mission trips is when I've been on church builders that first morning. Maybe 7, 7.30 in the morning, we gather on the slab for prayer and devotion. And and by 7.30, 8 o'clock, we're hammering away. And, And you've got folks just lined up, just working on this first wall. And nothing's in the air. But after about 20 minutes, 30 minutes, they get everybody all hands on deck and, and everybody comes together and raises that wall. And, and if one person were to do it, it couldn't be done. If two people were to do it, it couldn't be done. Ten people were to do it, it couldn't be done. But 100, 200 of us working on that wall, you're able to raise that wall. Something extraordinary happening when ordinary people come together and do their part. That's not to mention the folks in the cookie tent, my favorite place to be on church builders, where you get cookies and Gatorade and all kinds of stuff. And that's not to mention the folks who are making the good chicken fried steak and all that kind of stuff at lunch to make sure you have enough to eat. It takes everybody doing their part. And so this morning you say, well, you know what? I'm, I'm not Nehemiah, John. I'm not. I'm not the president. I'm not the pastor. I'm not the Sunday school teacher. I, I, at this point in my life, I can't go on a mission trip. But you know what? You have a part to play. You have a very important part to play in your life where you are. And your sphere of influence here at the church, you can be praying for somebody who needs to know Christ. You can be sowing seeds of love through acts of kindness and thoughtfulness and generosity in the lives of people. You can care for your aging parent. That's sacred work. You can care for a special needs child. You can visit the prisoner. You can care for the lonely. You can give a cup of cold water in the name of Jesus. And you're doing your part. Keep doing that. It was Edward Everett Hale. He said this. I said, I am only one, but I am one. I cannot do everything, but I can do something. And because I cannot do everything, I will not refuse to do the something that I can do. Nehemiah encouraged everybody to do their part. And when all this was happening, here's what happened. The wall was completed. And when the enemies heard about this, all the surrounding nations were afraid. And lost their self-confidence because they realized that this work had been done with the help of our God. You see, when ordinary people come together to do extraordinary things, God is glorified. God is glorified through all this. At the end of everything, Nehemiah was able to fulfill his mission. And then other people were able to say, you know what? We know he's just a man. He's just a cupbearer. He, He didn't do this. The Lord came in and the Lord helped him. And so the book of Nehemiah ends with with Ezra reading the book of the law on the temple. The the people were studying the Torah. There was confession of sin. There was covenant renewal. There was a vow to follow the Torah. There was a great celebration. Ordinary people did something extraordinary. A food taster rebuilt the city walls. We listen to a lot of read a lot of Dr. Seuss in our home these days. And we were reading the Lorax recently. You may know the line. Unless someone like you 
cares a whole awful lot. Nothing is going to get better. It's not. This week I heard a story about a woman named Carol. An ordinary person who decided to care. The, she, she now devotes one day of her week to serving the homeless through the nonprofit she founded, Nashville Street Barbers. She's a hairstylist. On, on Monday, she and other barbers head out to provide free haircuts to people in the homeless community. Another lady named Gina, who after noticing a rise in poverty in her school district, the elementary school teacher in Warren, Ohio, decided she wanted to help. And she founded Paw Pantry, a nonprofit that provides clothing, food, school supplies and hygiene items for any student in the district in need. Or, or a guy named Jeffrey that he was teaching special education at Lou Wallace School in Indiana. And he noted there was a large number of students who came to school with nothing warmer than a sweatshirt. Well, he got busy. He started clipping out coupons and he started shopping sales and he made a large batch of brand new fleece scarves for all 640 students. Or or there's a guy like Rodney Smith. He he was a computer science student. He saw an older man struggling to push his lawnmower and he didn't hesitate to help. And from there, he was inspired to create Raising Men Lawn Care Service, which helps people who lack time or physical ability or resource or money to keep their yard maintained. In July, their organization reached its goal by moving into their 50th state. You see, ordinary people who do extraordinary things. Seeing a need, having the courage to care enough to do something about the need. You know, God has always only used ordinary people to do extraordinary things. So I don't know how you view yourself. God can use you, but God is only always used ordinary people to do extraordinary things. The project was completed, Nehemiah's, in 52 days. You know, the book ends on a bit of a downer. Nehemiah comes to discover people were working on the Sabbath. They weren't supposed to be doing that. And so even though things had been going really well, the people still needed a change of heart. You know, as we've been studying the Old Testament and our series, The Story, We've we've seen many great stories of adventure and love and heartbreak and disappointment, faith and courage. But it's Malachi, who's the next prophet who comes along and says the next prophet who we know to be John the Baptist will be introducing us to the one we've been waiting for, the Messiah. So as we wrap up our Old Testament story this morning, it's my belief the world needs Christians like Nehemiah. I, I see it here at Pioneer Drive. We can keep doing what God's called us to do. We can also press into the heart of God and saying, what is he calling us to do now and into the future? Ordinary people who do extraordinary things, our, our family, our church, our, our, your business, our, your school, our, our community, our world needs us to, to be like Nehemiah in this day. To sit and to cry, to bend and pray, to stand up, to act, to define the mission. To defeat that discouragement. To do your part. And then in all that, God gets glorified. Unless someone like you cares a whole awful lot. Nothing is going to get better. It's not. Let's pray. Lord, I'm thankful for stories of people like Nehemiah. Thankful that in your plan, you choose to use people like him and people like the hundreds that are gathered, thousands that are gathered on this campus today. We know that you're a God that can do beyond all we can imagine. And so I I just pray as a church that each of us every single day are are being sensitive to the needs of other people, are, are praying about that. And God, what do you have for us? And that we're running after what you call us to do. And, and yeah, we're going to face naysayers and it's going to be an uphill battle maybe every step of the way. But that doesn't mean you're not in it. And so, God, give us the courage, whatever that is in our life this week. Caring for a parent, caring for a child. A ministry that you may be laying on our heart in our office. A person to reach out to in our school. Lord, help us to follow in Nehemiah's footsteps and see something extraordinary happen by ordinary people that you choose to use. It's in the name of Jesus that we offer our prayer. Amen. As we wrap up our time this morning of corporate worship, 
This is a time of response. Perhaps the, the greatest, most important time as we as we've encountered the Lord through wonderful song and through the preaching of God's word. But, but what is that going to mean for us when we walk out these doors? Maybe you're here today and you're ready to make Jesus the Lord of your life and to say, Jesus, I'm going to follow you. I'm a sinner. I need forgiveness. I need I need to turn to you. I'll be standing at the front and would love to talk with you about following Jesus and what that means. Maybe you're ready to make that decision. You can make that public today. You don't have to wait. You can do it right now. Maybe you're here today and you're ready to join Pioneer Drive Baptist Church. We'd love to have you come and officially be a part of our church family. Come see us. Come see me right here at the front uh, as we have a time of response. I'd love to visit with you about that. And you can join Pioneer Drive today. But all of us, what's God, What's our day? How are we going to be Nehemiah's in our day? What, what's that look like for you? Allow the Holy Spirit freedom and creativity and imagination to see the possibilities that might be possible in your life this week. Let's stand and let's respond as the Spirit leads.